Welcome everyone to an Ekinkar Soul Adventure, coming to you from the worldwide home of Ekinkar in Chanhassen, Minnesota. My name is Doug Kunin, and I'm your host for today. We're delighted to have listeners from all over the world for this, our first ever podcast. And we want you to know we're here to support you on your spiritual adventures, whether it's navigating the road trip of daily life, voyages into higher awareness, or the quest for deeper truth. Maybe you'll hear a story, technique, or insight that will add to your spiritual toolkit, or it might validate your own experiences. So let's get on the road and hear from our guests. We're here with Stella Forsberg, a world traveler, a loyal resident of Minnesota. For sure. Yes. And a skilled meeting planner. Welcome, Stella. Thanks for having me, Doug. It's exciting to be here. Thank you. Sure thing. And we have Carl Oresik, a talented software engineer who comes from upstate New York, now here in Minnesota. Both our guests are longtime students of the Ek teachings, as is yours truly. Our question and theme for today is, is there more to life than what we see? Now, Stella and Carl, our listeners can probably guess that if you're on this show, it's because you have a yes answer to that question. Absolutely. Am I right? That was the agreement. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah. Great. Well, that's the beauty of it. Each person discovers their own answer to that question. So, Stella, can you tell us about your journey to yes, there is Ooh. more life? Yeah, I sure can. So for me, it, it um, started when I was 13 years old, and my dad had passed away unexpectedly. He had died in his sleep. And I remember finding him in his bed and feeling something wake up in me. Something very deep and very real woke up. And in that moment, the quest was on. And I didn't understand it fully yet, but it, a little switch went on. That's what I knew. And the next few years that followed after that were really tough years for me. I uh, felt really lost, confused, and uh, it was hard for me to engage in daily life. I'll say that. I used to be, um, at before that, before my dad died, I was really just engaged with my friends in school and sports. And the moment that something woke up in me, um, all of that took the back seat, and there was this call that I needed to know more. All I knew at the time was that my dad worked every day, all the time, and then died at 48. And to me, that didn't make any sense. To, what is the point of this life is all I could think of at that time. And then finally, four years later, before I was ready to graduate from high school, I took this late night bike ride, which is something I always did just to kind of feel grounded and connected to God. So I ended up at my dad's gravesite. I remember getting off my bike, walking to his gravesite, falling to my knees, sobbing. And then a moment later, I felt this immense wave of love wash through me. And it poured through me from my toes all the way through the top of my head. And I felt the tingles, and I felt all this love, and I was bursting with gratitude and bursting with relief. And I knew in that moment that there was way more to life than what I could see. My question had been answered, and um, I just felt like I was rescued, actually. That's what I felt like. Did you see or hear anything in that moment? No, all I felt was this immense tingly sensation in the presence of my dad squeezing his energy around me and the love and nothing else. And then the awareness that I was feeling something so real and life was, my daily life was not anywhere near it, but I was feeling something really real. So you, you've had this profound experience at the side of your dad's gravesite. How did this experience change you in terms of how you continued on? And were you still on a search? 
Ooh. That's all I thought about, actually. So that's a great question. I finished high school a couple of months later. I went right into college, and I did all I could just to get through the college experience. I knew that was something I needed to do. But throughout the entire time, I still felt deep within me this yearning, this call, that the moment I had true freedom, I was going to start seeking proactively. I was going to start seeking truth. I was going to figure out who I am, what I'm doing here. I was going to ideally discover tools and a true path that would give me those answers. So what was your next step after college? Or maybe this you found other steps while you were in college. Yeah, actually, no. College was about survival and the books. That's okay. it. Like, I, I was not a college student. And... <laughs> Uh, it was all I could do just to hang on to get through those days. Um, but as soon as I got done with college, I just honored my nudges. And I had made a commitment at the gravesite that I was going to live my life according to my heart. And that was that. Like, that was my mission. My dad lived according to his brain and the fear. And I committed, no, I will follow my heart and truth, and that will be that. So as soon as I finished college... I became aware of the Peace Corps, and I knew the Peace Corps was, you know, serving people in a third world country. And my heart lit up when that came across my path, and I got into the Peace Corps. I served in Tonga um, in the South Pacific for a few years. And that was the time when life really got to slow down. I had a lot of quiet time. And in that quiet time, I started journaling to God a lot. I asked all my big burning questions. I spent a lot of time then starting to focus on my dreams. I started journaling my dreams and trying to figure out what they meant to me. And then I ended up, uh, after the Peace Corps, I went straight into a spiritual retreat center that was based in Washington State in this delicious little village up, nestled up in the Cascade Mountains. Um, you know, like a little river and snow and just gorgeous, pristine perfect spot for me. The huge gift in this time of my life was that everyone in that village, they were also lovers of God. They were also seeking truth. And we all came from all different paths. I got to spend those three years being my own spiritual teacher. I read everything I could, and I talked to all these people about what they believed and what they learned, and I felt all kinds of things wake up in me. And from, like, different spiritual books of reincarnation, past lives, chakras, rune stones, Enneagram, astrology, like, I was <laughs> everywhere. And what I learned by the end of those three years was that while a lot had woken up and I knew I wanted to continue this path, my method was too broad. It was like this giant sprinkler just hitting the surface of all of this. And I had not yet discovered the one thing that could help me go deep and far. And that's all I wanted to do. I was exhausted, to be honest with you, with the search of not knowing where to look. All I wanted was to get that level of love that I had experienced at the gravesite. Mm. And I had spent all these years, which is like 10, 12 years at this point, and still searching. A week before I was to leave this village, I had a dream. And this dream was like more vibrant and alive than anything I had experienced yet. And in the dream, I found myself standing on a green rolling hill, like in The Sound of Music. And I remember thinking in the dream state, whoa, this place is gorgeous. It's like The Sound of Music, you know? <laughs> and the moment that my heart was that open and aware and grateful, I was zooming through the sky and zooming through the darkness and then zooming through all these stars so fast I could feel the wind. And when I could feel the wind, I became so giddy and excited, I started yelling. And in that moment, I was like, ah, you know? And in that moment then, I felt the presence of a, of a guide with me. And in a millisecond, I was aware of all these other connections. This guide had always been with me. I knew this presence with me. I could not see him. I couldn't see my own body. But boy, could I feel his love. And I knew that this guide of mine had been with me at the gravesite, 
had been with me and brought me to the Peace Corps, had been with me in my dream state, had been with me in this village where I started reading all these things. And finally, my guide was like with me in this new God worlds traveling. And I knew all of this in a millisecond, right? This just full awareness. And with all this gratitude bursting in me, I was like, I love you so much. I was yelling. And then I was like, take me more, take me further. I want to know more. And so then we shot further and faster. And then all of a sudden, just like that, sound entered the experience. And all I could hear was, <laughs> and then I started laughing again because it just reminded me of the cartoon, The Jetsons. Yes. You guys know that? Right. So that's what I was laughing. And then a moment later, I was splat back in my bed in my physical body. But what I knew when I got up from that bed is that I was different. I was in a new state of consciousness. What I knew was that not only was there more to this life than what I could see, but I finally knew that I was more than this physical body. I knew that I was soul and that I am existing on these higher planes of God all the time and that my guide is with me all the time and that the experience I had just had was the tiny tip of the iceberg and I knew it. And all I could do then was like, ah, show me more. But what I finally knew is I really had a guide. So a week after I had that experience, I was back in Minnesota living with my mom. She was my transition place. And at that time, I was looking for my next spiritual step. So that's what I was writing to God all the time. Just, I need a spiritual teacher. And while at her house, at my mom's house, I went through a local magazine, and there was this advertisement that jumped out at me. And it was like, hey, free dream workshop over at the Temple of Akinkar. And I saw that, and I was like, my heart opened up, and I knew exactly I was going to that free dream workshop. The temple was across the street from my mom's house. So, like, that's crazy. Even I noticed that level of coincidence. Like, I'm going there. So I drove into the parking lot for the class. And honestly, the moment I drove into the parking lot, I felt this level of love and just calm, peace, relaxation pour through me. And excitement all at the same time. I knew I was home. I had found my spiritual home. I knew it in the parking lot. I got into the temple, and in this class, there were like 15 or 20 people. And everyone was sharing their experience with dreams and past lives. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love these people. These are my people. I understand what they're saying. I shared with them my dream that I had had just the week prior. And these people understood what I experienced. They got it. And I learned that night that what I had experienced was a soul travel experience. It was beyond dreaming. I also learned that night that my inner guide was actually the Mahanta, the living Ek master of Ekankar. These guys gave me all these answers, and I felt all these things starting connecting inside me. And, and that was that. Like, I had my teacher, I had my path, and the clarity was like, like nothing I had ever expected. Wow. Yeah, man. I worked hard for that. I but I got you, there. You did. Yeah. Now, a pivotal part is and was a spiritual guide. People might be wondering, well, how does that work? Does everyone already have a spiritual guide? I'm going to say yes. Okay. I can't prove that to anybody else. But okay. for myself, I'm going to say yes, absolutely. Um, I didn't know I had a guide. Okay. When I was a kid, I had no idea I had a guide. I just was cruising through life. Then my dad died and something woke up in me. I started to become aware of that voice of love that was pulling or calling me. That's my guide. Okay. And I feel like there's a chance where everyone, when they reach a certain experience in their life, becomes aware when they are quiet. They can right. feel the awakening of right. a presence of love. Also, our listeners may be wondering about the Mahanta, the Living Ek Master. So by way of background to that, in every era, there's a primary teacher for the Ek Path who's known as the Mahanta, the Living Ek Master. And today, this is Sri Harold Klemp. 
And his mission is simply to awaken the God knowledge that's already within us. He's the leader of a long line of spiritual adepts stretching throughout history, touching every culture of the world. And these adepts are known as the Ek masters. Now, Ek means the God force, the life current, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. It's divine love and action coming into our life. And we've touched on some elements of it in your story of uh, hearing and seeing qualities, the light and sound happens frequently, and we're going to be diving into that a little bit. They're just simply masters of life, and they always respect the freedom of others and won't enter into their personal life without definite permission. That's actually a lot how I experienced it. So when I was a kid, as I mentioned, I had no idea I had a guide. I had the experience with my dad. I felt something wake up. It was at that moment, though, that I remember starting to ask God for help. Up until then, I hadn't asked God for help. It wasn't on my brain. It wasn't in my heart. I didn't need it. But at that moment, I started asking for help, and that's when I started really getting in tune with nudges and being guided, right. that call of soul. And then after I found Ekankar, that just became, I became way more aware of how to ask for help and bring myself closer to my guide. That's that conscious co-workership, which, which points to the very definition of Ekankar, which means co-worker with God. So it's that conscious, creative co-workership with the divine element that really propels us forward to the deeper discoveries that await us. Carl, you had some deep discoveries, too, in finding that there's more to life than what we see. Yeah. Can you share us... Share with us your journey. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. There's similarities between Stella's experience and mine, certain, certain common themes that run through this, which is really interesting. For me, it was, who am I and why am I here? And it's strange that you would think that that question would bother a six-year-old, <laughs> but it was about the time we started religious instruction. I mean, I started learning about soul and heaven and hell and all this good stuff. But also, it got me thinking, you know, we were told that you have a soul. That's how we were taught. You have a soul. But then in my six-year-old brain, I'm thinking, but if I have a soul, then what am I? I'm worried <laughs> about me. What's this thing that has a soul here, you know? Good question. <clears throat> then it got me thinking. I'm there like, well, I don't remember who or what I was before like a year or two ago, like maybe age five or four. And then I was like, okay, did I exist before my earliest memories? And then I fast forward, I, I know about death now. Well, what's going to happen to me after I die? Am I going to just go poof? You know, so I was in between a hard, hard place and a rock, you know, and in the middle, where's the meaning now in the middle? If I didn't exist before I was born and nothing's going to happen, I'm going to disappear when I die. What's the point of the middle? So I made a conscious decision at that time. I was going to suppress this thought, these lines of questions, because there were, I was just going to, there was no good end to it. You know, I have to, I have to be a kid and have fun. So I made this conscious decision, <laughs> you know, just be normal. Be you normal. Know, be normal. So life went on, and I had what I would call a few spiritual experiences, you know, between like, say, age 6 and 18. Uh, kind of subtle things, you know, like, uh, ooh, you know, get this nudge when I was like, when I was like seven years old or so, I was with my buddy and we, I got this nudge to start digging in some gravel between these garages in our back alley, just totally random. I found 10 shiny pennies, brand new pennies. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It was like, they weren't even tarnished. Can you dig over at my house? Yeah. <laughs> nice. I dig all the time now. There's always gold. You just have to know where to dig for it. That's amazing. <laughs> so, you know, there was that. There was this one time I was humming to myself. You know, I was bored. I was just kind of humming. You know, and, and I noticed if I hummed a certain way, it would make my whole head resonate. You know, if you, the whole, the bone structure and yes, stuff. Right. And I'm doing this, I'm playing around and I'm doing it. And then I just, they have like two or three minutes. And then I just kind of stopped. And then it was like, I was kind of being lifted up in this mm. kind of fizzy area, this fizzy light. Mm. And it really felt good. I really liked being there. But I could only stay there for like 10 seconds. And I came back down like a, like a balloon kind of falling back to earth. And I made note of that. I said, that is really interesting. I was probably about 12 or 13 at that time. I said, that's interesting. I have to figure out how to get back to this place, you know. 
So file that away. It's, it goes in the back burner, way in the back burner. But something dramatic happened when I was uh, a senior in high school. I was in study hall, and my friend in front of me had this book, and it was called Journeys Out of the Body by Robert Monroe. And I saw that title, Out of the Body, and it was like a lightning bolt hit me. It brought back my original age six quest to find out what I really was, what this soul is. And I insisted that he loan me the book after he was done, and he agreed. That evening or the next day, my attention, this was on my attention now, this out of the body, out of the body. I you know, was tired after, after school and I'd sometimes just stretch out on the easy chair and the TV was on. My sister was watching TV in the room. She's my older sister. And I stretched out on the, uh, on the easy chair and I kind of got in between sleep and wakefulness. And the sound entered the top of my head. And it just kind of filled my entire being. And it was like, if you've ever been to Niagara Falls and been on the Maid to the Mist, yeah, and you hear that roaring sound, mm. and it's like you could feel it right in your bones and you could hear it. It was going through me like electric current. Wow. Or like being uh, near the exhaust of a jet engine on, you know, on the runway, idling, that kind of whirring, powerful sound. And I found that I love being in this state. It was like I was in heaven. It was, um, it was an ecstasy. And the more I put my attention and love into this sound, the stronger it got. And I got carried into it. And as I got too far into it, I get kind of scared, you know, and I, I kind of like withdraw my attention from it and it would let me go back down kind of into my body again. It was kind of going out of my body and back in my body. And this lasted for like two or three minutes. And it just kind of died down on its own. And while I was in that state, it was like this, this power, this freedom, this love. It was all combined. And it, I knew at that moment that whatever I was, I was part of whatever this sound was, whatever this energy was, whatever this life force was. And from that point on, it basically answered my question, uh, who am I? I knew I was connected to something divine. Right. And I had the experience for myself. It was firsthand. No one could take it away from me. And Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do after that? Well, yeah. it's like, okay, I, I come back in the body. My sister's over there watching TV. You know, life as normal <laughs> was not going to continue. It's like... Amazing. And... Um, Big worlds happen with... are existing within us. Oh, yes. Yes. So... Fast forward another year, I go to college. I'm reading lots of books on how to get out of the body and what's this all mean. Very few references on sound, on sound current and things like that. And uh, in the school newspaper, it was called the Daily Collegian, I remember. In the editorial section, there was this debate going back and forth of whose vision of heaven was the true vision. And then this one person wrote in and said, I'm a member of Ekinkar or I practice Ek and Kar, and I practice the spiritual exercises of Ek. I have seen the various levels of heaven firsthand, and I suggest if you would like to find out for yourself to look up the books of Ek and Kar. Wow, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a way how this works, how to get out of the body, how to connect with the sound again, this great place. So I found the books in the library at the school, and I read the books, and this was like a user's manual to the universe and beyond. It talked all about the sound current and there were various sounds on different planes you could experience. There was soul travel, there was intuition, there was a spiritual hierarchy, there was, um, you name it, it explained everything. And when you mentioned spiritual planes, oh yeah, can you just share a brief description or explanation of what that might mean? What it means is that there are these different dimensions that live within us and they reach all the way from this physical world that we live in day to day and they reach all the way back to where God comes from. And in between, there's these various levels or dimensions of experience that we can get into and various degrees of being closer to God. So it talked all about these different experiences and about spiritual guides and it named some of these spiritual guides. 
so I tried these spiritual exercises and I tried one in particular and I was doing some singing a, a word, one of these uh, ancient names for God. It was a chant. So I laid down to, to, to go to bed and immediately as I fell asleep, then I saw an image of this man. He had this red robe on and this black beard and he had his arms crossed in front of him. He was just in my spiritual vision, right between my eyes, kind of where I was looking out in my vision. And he was just looking at me for about two or three seconds, and then he disappeared. It was interesting. And I later found out his name was Rebbe Zartars. He's a spiritual traveler, uh, one of the spiritual guides of Ekankar, one of these Ek masters. And so I woke up, you know, I got out of bed. I said, well, I'm all up now. You know, I'm all, my parts beating and stuff. So I might as well go to the bathroom or something like that. You know, so I start, walk out of bed, I go to the bathroom. And when I'm in the bathroom, I notice everything has this luminescence glow to it. And I said, I'm out of the body. Oh. I said, oh my gosh. So I walk back and I think, what am I going to do now? And so I walk back into the kitchen, my dream body, my out of the body body. And I said, I'll just go flying. I got this idea, so I, I see the window and I aim for the window and I reach my arms out and I fly through the window and I'm above town. I'm looking at all the rooftops, this is a starry night and this sense of freedom and, and it's like, wow, I'm like not part of the body anymore. I'm totally separate from the body. You know, the body isn't who we truly are. So it was like building on my earlier experience with the sound. And uh, this experience lasted a few moments and I came back in the body. So I tried some more things with the books. I was working on my own at this point with just the books and what was in there and these spiritual exercises. And I wasn't really making the good progress that I was wanting to, I was kind of stuck in a rut and it was frustrating. And it was at some point where I was uh, on the road in the car and I drove by a neck and car center and it caught my attention. I called them up, I figured out their phone number, I said, why are you there? I couldn't understand why there had to be a building with Ekankar on it because I thought everything was in the books and everything was inside in these inner worlds. And they said, with membership, there's these personal discourses. And with membership, there's initiations and hooked up with the sound current and things like that. And all of a sudden it made sense to me. This is what I needed. I needed this connection with the teacher. I, I was looking for, like you still, I was looking yeah. for a teacher but it just never clicked with me. So I had to have this other experience first. So I'm trying to do it on my own entirely. So I, that's why I wanted to say, oh, and that day I, I sent away for the discourses and became a member. That's how I got to the point where, who am I? And the other part was, why am I here? And through the teachings of Ekankar, I learned our whole purpose of being here is to be uh, vehicles for God's love. And the freedom and the joy and the liberation to be able to, to just live your life and not have to worry about where I came from, what's gonna happen after I die. It helps to know soul is eternal. Yes, and that's a big step. That's a big step and it's just not this life. And of course, we live many lives as souls being continually refined and polished. And in our lives, we face major challenges as we all have. And those are there for a reason. You know, the saying that life isn't happening to us, these events don't happen. They happen for, for us. us. Yeah. And on that theme, if, if life is for us and we have the joyful experiences, but we also have all these also painful or challenging experiences, how do they get there? How, how do those for us experiences, whether to the human eyes they're good or bad, get there? Good question. <laughs> I'll just articulate that we, as in I soul, am happy to have these experiences, <laughs> but I, my lower body, Stella, am not always happy to have certain experiences exactly. because they're not always physically easy or emotionally awesome. You know, sometimes they're quite challenging emotionally. What I have loved and come to learn is that, just even the way I'm talking right now, I guess, is that I have finally learned to understand that I'm soul and I have different bodies. And I love seeing myself in these different bodies. So I soul, I'm eternal, 
I am divine love. I'm connected with the highest, truest source of knowledge, of knowing. And as I move through the lower worlds, which is the lower planes, like you were talking about earlier, Carl, um, these planes of vibration, of consciousness, they each carry a different vibration. And um, the lowest is this physical plane, and it's got a pretty dense vibration, and we have a physical body to hang out here. And I have loved learning the distinction between a physical body that I can see and feel, and the next body, my emotional body that lives on the astral plane, so I know when my emotions are taken over, and then going up a little higher in vibration to the causal plane where all my memories are. And I love that these act teachings have taught me how to recognize where my state of consciousness mm. is at any given moment. And that's the adventure, right? That's part of the soul adventure for me. Neck and Car is amazing at giving me tools to give me structure because my lower bodies, my brain really wants that structure. That soul perspective really gives us an ability to see the overview of all the patterns. Yes. And when we're caught in one of these conflict situations or difficult experiences, if we're able to rise in the soul consciousness, we see more of the purpose and the reason for these things happening. Something I have loved in this life is I started out in the poor me version, like, poor me, like, this is happening. I, am, I have no ability to change anything. Poor me. And that perspective that you just described is amazing at changing my attitude and my, my viewpoint and my ability in a millisecond, like, just going from, like, wow. Actually, I caused this to happen because of my little attitude over there. I was being judgmental or whatever. And a millisecond later, I can see the spiritual opportunity in it, and I can say, thank you. I get it. I wasn't in divine love in that moment. And I can shift. I can take responsibility. So you both have been on a, a, a long journey, many experiences, and these began when you were younger. One of the questions is, you can have these peak experiences. You both have described these amazing peak experiences. And people naturally want to be able to have that more than just once a lifetime or once every 20 years. So what are some of the tools you've used in keeping the journey going so you're always unfolding and not just staying static with the memory of something that happened in the past? I like to think of it as like, um, like we're going to a spiritual gym. You talk about the ability to tap into this, this pool of wisdom or spiritual uh, light and sound and this source of love. When you're in a situation that you really have to draw on this to work something out in the moment, the spiritual exercises, you know, what I do is I try to do them every day for 20 minutes or so. And what I'm doing is I'm tapping into this source of love. You put the work in, you put the effort in uh, every day a little bit. And as things come up during the day, as problems come up, as relationships, you know, you're in the middle of a, some sort of relationship. And basically we're trying to, like I said, give and receive love. It keeps the channel open. It keeps the channel to creativity open. And so with that creativity, you can do anything in life, right? But you want to have it available in the moment. I think what I love most is the day-to-day, -day, that higher vibration, just way of being and letting the surprises happen in such unique, unexpected ways. So for me, I like Carl. Um, I do start my day every day with a spiritual exercise. But truly, first thing I wake up, I write down my dreams. Okay. That's just a practice. And then I do a spiritual exercise and I sing the word hue. And when I'm doing that, I am aligning myself, my consciousness with that, the word hue, this source of divine love at this highest vibration. And when I'm doing the spiritual exercise, I'm just allowing my imagination to travel, to explore, to have a good time, to learn what it needs to learn. And after 20, 30 minutes, I'm done. I can feel myself kind of wrapping it up. And, I, and then I start my day. But before I start my day and actually get dressed and do all that, 
I just have a practice that I love doing, which is asking my inner guide to point out one moment in the day where I get to be of love in some way. Just an unexpected little way where I can bring love to someone in some kind of way. And then I go about my day. And I stay alert somewhere in the back of my mind. I'm looking for it. And that puts some fun adventure in it. Setting a goal, creative goal for the Yeah, day. it's this cool. I just love the little dance, the little conversation that happens between me and my inner guide. And to me, that keeps the warm fire um, lit all the time in me. And it also keeps the vibration of fun and wonderment happening just in my daily stuff. Now, Stella, you mentioned the hue, which is an ancient mantra and a sacred sound and forms the basis of a lot of the spiritual exercises in ACT. And the hue is something anyone can try from any path of religion. A couple of weeks ago, you each, when you were talking about the spiritual exercises, you talked about how it builds in spiritual muscle memory. And I personally have found that for me, that one of the spiritual muscles is the spiritual eye, often known as the third eye, but the spiritual eye, which helps us see life more clearly through all these complex layers of life that you've both talked about. And, and yeah. the hue expands that. And we begin to see these invisible laws of life that are working behind the scenes for everyone. They're laws of life. And how the hue can help us to see new spiritual colors and dimensions. And we thought we'd give you a, a sample of this Hugh chant or Hugh song. It's, it's just a carrier of love between soul and the divine. You can get a chance to hear it, maybe try it out on your own, just to get the feel of it. So we're going to run a short audio clip of Sri Harold Klemp. He's the spiritual leader of Ekankar, as we noted earlier. And in this clip, he's giving a Hugh exercise to an audience of seekers and spiritual students at an international Ekankar seminar and you'll get to hear a portion of a group hue chant with thousands of people singing it. So here we go. Make yourself comfortable if you're a guest here and not familiar with us or our ways, that's fine. Just sit and be comfortable if nothing else. But when you shut your eyes, look into the center here, spiritual eye area, sometimes called third eye. When you sing Hugh, know that this is one of the most sacred names for God. Sing it with love and with reverence and look for the light, listen for the sound. You may or may not have anything tonight. I'd be very surprised if you did, but just to show you how to practice it and do it on your own. It'll give you the spiritual insight that other people wish they had, but it doesn't come overnight. You have to develop this like any other skill. So let's begin with you. You. I'd like to ask Carl and Stella, do you remember the first time you heard or sang the hue? I do. I do. do. Okay. Yes. Um, for me, it was after I had found Akinkar from that dream class. So I'd heard it in the class. Um, at the time, I was too in my mental body and too uh, feeling too many other things to really be present in it. So for me, I didn't have an experience with it until later when I got home and I could be relaxed and quiet in my bedroom. And then I remember working with it and just feeling through the very core of me, the quiet. And outside was very noisy, you know, like my head, my brain, it's noisy. It's got a lot of energy that moves through it. 
and I'm aware of it as I go through my day. But at the very core of me, I became very aware during that first hue of the quiet sense, the stream of love, the peace, and that called to me. And it's like the, the iris of the eye that opens. That's what it felt like. And then the noise of the outside started getting further away. And my heart started to open up toward it. What a beautiful description of some of the qualities of soul when we're in, who in, we it. Were, in it and who we really are, that calm and happy state. And, you know, a lot of techniques strive for uh, silencing the mind and achieving absolute stillness. This seemed to be an experience where that naturally came to the fore. Yeah, but I think the difference is not focusing on my mind. I placed my focus right on the sound of that calm energy and the sense of love that came from it. Right. That's where I placed my focus. And further away, I became, you know, I was aware of my thoughts and the noise, but that got further away. Right. Great. Carl, I think actually the first time I practiced the hue was when I told of my experience as a boy humming to himself and finding a sound that really felt good and resonated, I you might say stumbled upon the hue, hmm. right. which is interesting because it's something inherent in our, in our atoms that it responds to. Never heard of anything like that. I never heard of chanting or anything like that. I grew up in a small town. We didn't have <laughs> books on the, on yoga or anything like that. In our <laughs> yeah, library. Yeah. yeah. So I just think it's, it was amazing that, our, our actual being, the actual fiber of our being, of our, even our physical body down to that level, responds to this name of God. Yes, yeah, it's, it's said that it's the hue is uh, the sound behind all sounds, and it's just part of that natural language of, of living and being. So uh, recently, within the past few weeks, uh, I went to the doctor uh, for a regular checkup, and I pull into the parking lot. And just over a couple spaces down, I noticed a license plate on a car that said H-R-T-N-S-O-L. Cute. And immediately it just emblazoned heart and soul. Yeah. It was this little nugget, heart and soul. And for me, this is the golden-tongued wisdom of everyday life, listening for these clues. And at the moment, I, I wondered, oh, what's going to happen today? How am I going to... How am I going to apply heart and soul? So I went into the doctor. I came out with a clean bill of health. Everything's great. So I get in my car, and I'm on the freeway, and I see a car up ahead. It's the same. It's the heart and soul car up ahead Ooh. of me. And so when you get two of these in a row, and this is, was an hour later of first seeing it or more, and you see this again, Somebody's trying to tell you something. <laughs> yeah. And I asked Divine Spirit, show me what I need to learn from this. I went through the rest of my day, nothing completely lit up. And at a certain point, I got behind schedule and I needed to get to a meeting about this podcast. And because of a mix-up between my wife and I, I had to park somewhere I don't normally park, and I'm uh-oh, I'm getting minutes behind here. I got to rush in there. And as I got out of my car, it was right next to a pine tree. And I heard a bird singing in the tree. And it was the most beautiful notes. And I had this inner nudge, just slow down. You're moving too fast. Just listen. And this bird was singing with ecstatic joy, these notes mm -hmm. of bird symphony that just went into me in a deep way. It was, it was going... <laughs> like that. So after some moments, I just was uplifted by that music and went in to the meeting. And literally an hour or so later, I came back out and it was still there singing majestically with the joy of living. Mm. This, this heart and soul 
of this bird uh, touched my heart. Now, the full conclusion of my understanding of it didn't happen until later when I told my wife, and she said, heart and soul, that's what you're doing on this podcast. Everyone's here sharing their own spiritual song of living and learning, and we're here to help others, if they so choose, to hear their own heart song and to sing it and to notice what you notice because the heart has its own intelligence. And each one of us as soul has a destiny to become much more than we are today. So along with this theme of adventure and discovery, let's try our wings with a spiritual exercise. Now, a spiritual exercise is a conversation with the most sacred, secret part of ourselves. And that's the place where we come into contact with the higher power, the God force, the one, whatever name you might give to it. So this exercise is something anyone can try of any path. It's called Seeds of Destiny. And it has two parts, an inner side and an outer side. The first part is an inner contemplation and after that, I'll gently bring you back and give the second part of the exercise, which you can try during the activities of your day. Of course, feel free to pause the podcast at any time and spend as much time as you want in your experience. So here's the visualization. Feel free to listen along, see it, feel it. And it goes like this. Find a quiet place, settle in and take a couple of deep breaths. You can close your eyes and begin to chant Hugh in a long drawn out breath. Repeat this for several moments. As you do this, imagine seeing the light of God as a huge golden sun pouring its warmth into your life. Imagine the seeds of your spiritual destiny opening to this light and taking form in your daily life. Let's gently come back from that inner experience. During your day, ask for inner guidance to show you where new spiritual life is growing in your deeds, thoughts, and actions. Take time to reflect or journal on this at the end of your day. So there are so many different techniques, a menu of many options to work with. It's a spiritual laboratory. Right here, I've got a virtual gift bag with all, ooh. Kinds, ooh, all kinds of spiritual goodies in there. What's in there, Doug? Um, <laughs> let me take a look. Well, here's something great. If you like that exercise, uh, we have a written version of it at ekincard.org forward slash podcast. And you can go from there with it. Also, if you've enjoyed hearing about the hue and want to explore it further, this ancient mantra for today, mm. yeah, check out our free hue app. It's got a 20-minute hue chant. You can play on your cell phone or device. It's got some easy-to-try spiritual exercises, and you can get the links to this hue app on Apple and on Google Play at the podcast page as well. This is a great app, you guys. I mean, having the hue just sing when I'm waiting in traffic or something. It is very delightful to have. There's a lot of other interactive information and resources on the Hue at a special webpage. It's called giftofhue.org, giftofhue.org. And we've posted that link as well on the ekincard.org forward slash podcast page. Well, we've really had a wonderful soul adventure today. 
it's just been amazing. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Stella and Carl. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. You've been great travel companions. So until next time, all the best on your soul adventures. <laughs>